Drosophila biologists have a really great tradition for naming genes. Now, in many cases, genes are named after their mutant phenotypes. So let's say, for example, that you discovered a new Drosophila gene, and animals with a mutation in that gene failed to form wings. Well, then you might choose to name that gene wingless. And in fact, wingless is an actual Drosophila gene. Here's a picture of a wingless mutant. We'll talk more about this gene and what it does in just a few minutes, and then again in further detail later on in the course. Now some researchers get really creative with this and come up with some incredibly clever gene names. And so before I go on, I wanted to take just a minute to tell you about a few of my favorite Drosophila genes. First, there's cheap date, and flies with a mutation in the cheap date gene exhibit enhanced sensitivity to alcohol. Flies can become intoxicated just like humans, and cheap date mutants are more sensitive to the effects of ethanol than wild type flies. Next, there's coitus interruptus. Mutations in this gene cause a reduction in copulation time. So normally, copulation lasts for about 15 to 20 minutes in Drosophila. But males with a coitus interruptus mutation finish copulation prematurely. And while we're on the subject of fruit fly mating, I should add that there's also a gene named Stuck. You can look it up if you don't believe me. And you can probably guess what that phenotype is. Next on my list is Tin Man, which is named after the wonderful Wizard of Oz character. So as you might guess, uh, Tin Man mutants, just like their namesake, fail to develop a heart. And then finally, there's my all-time favorite, Ken and Barbie. Mutations in the Ken and Barbie gene result in flies that fail to develop external sex organs, which of course is exactly the same phenotype that you'll find in Ken and Barbie dolls. Like I said, pretty clever, right? You can't say that biologists don't have a good sense of humor. But all jokes aside, um, these genes and their mutant phenotypes provide a really nice illustration of the fundamental concept in genetics. And that is that if you inhibit a particular gene, whether through mutation or some other means, and then you determine uh, what happens as a consequence, so what's the resulting phenotype, that allows you to infer something about the normal function of that gene in wild-type animals. Let's come back to the example of the wingless gene here. Now, if wingless mutants fail to form wings, well, then it stands to reason that the wingless gene must play a critical role in wing development in wild-type flies. So wingless is a protein coding gene. It codes for the production of wingless protein. And given that information, you would assume that the wingless protein must have some kind of activity that promotes normal wing development. In fact, we know today that wingless protein acts as a signaling molecule that binds to specific receptor molecules and instructs cells to adopt wing fates. And we'll talk more about how that works in future lectures. Okay, let me give you an example of a mutation to interpret uh, that's just a little bit more challenging before we move on. So let's say you've identified a loss of function mutation, and that's a mutation that uh, interrupts the normal function of the gene. And this mutation results in mice that have muscles twice as large as in wild type. And by the way, there are mutations that fall into this category, and uh, I'll tell you more about them a little later in the course. Okay, so let me pose two questions for you. Number one, uh, what would you name this gene? And let's uh, follow the convention for naming Drosophila genes that I just told you about. Number two, uh, what would you conclude about the normal function of this gene? So I'll give you a second to think about that, and if you need more time, of course, you can hit pause. Okay, so if we're going to be clever about naming this gene, maybe we'd call it Superman or Hercules or something like that. We're naming it after the mutant phenotype. And based on this mutant phenotype, we'd assume that the normal function of the gene in wild-type mice is to inhibit muscle growth. And that's why I said this example is a little bit more challenging. Uh, intuitively, I think it's more straightforward to think about a gene functioning to activate or promote a process. But there are certainly lots of important genes that inhibit growth and various other developmental processes. And that would be the case here.
Okay, so the basic genetics approach that I've just discussed has been really, really useful for uh, identifying and characterizing basic mechanisms of development. So if you want to understand, let's say, how a fruit fly wing develops, well, a great place to start is to identify genes that are required for that process. Now that's just a start. You still have lots of work left to do in terms of uh, determining how those genes function at a cellular molecular level and how they're regulated and how they work with other genes and, and so on. So it's just a start, but that does give you a lot of insight into how your developmental process you're studying um, works. So how does this work in practice? What I want to do for the remainder of this lecture is to give you a quick introduction to the major experimental techniques involved in analyzing gene function. And I'm just going to very briefly introduce the key methods here, and then we'll examine each of them in greater detail in the next few lectures. Broadly speaking, there are two general approaches that geneticists take to analyze gene function. The first begins with the identification of a phenotype of interest. So that's step one, to identify the specific phenotype that you're after. Now that would typically happen in the context of a genetic screen. So maybe, for example, uh, you've mutagenized a bunch of fruit flies and you're screening for animals that lack wings or something like that. Once you identify that phenotype of interest, uh, then your challenge becomes determining what mutation led to that particular phenotype. So that would be step two, uh, determining the underlying genotype. So this approach is referred to as forward or classical genetics. And that may seem a bit confusing because it sounds backwards in that uh, you're starting here with a phenotype of interest and then backtracking to figure out what genotype was responsible for that phenotype but it's referred to as forward genetics to distinguish it from the reverse approach, which was developed a little bit later, and then I'm gonna come back to in just a minute. Now the key consideration with forward genetics is that you're typically inducing random mutations in the genetic screen. And because the mutations that you're generating could be anywhere in the genome, once you find your phenotype of interest, your work is really just beginning because now you're faced with the task of identifying the specific mutation. So what was the specific change in DNA sequence that resulted in that phenotype? That's getting easier with modern sequencing technology, but it's still a lot of work. A great example of this forward genetics approach that we already covered in lecture three of this unit was the Weishaus Nusslein Fullhard screen for mutations that disrupted the normal segmentation pattern in Drosophila larvae. So remember they started by inducing random mutations and then screening for larvae with defects in the number or pattern of larval body segments. And then they figured out what genes had been mutated to cause those phenotypes. So again, that's a really nice example of classic or forward genetics. The alternative to forward genetics is called reverse genetics. And as the name implies, that approach just goes the other way around. So with reverse genetics, we're gonna start out with a gene of interest, and then we wanna determine uh, what happens when we inhibit that gene. So in other words, uh, step one here is to make a very specific change in genotype, and then step two with reverse genetics is to determine the resulting phenotype. This approach has become really popular as we have sequenced genomes for more and more species. So with a genome sequence in hand, you have all these genes that can be identified by computer algorithms, and the challenge is to figure out what all those genes do. Well, you can take a reverse genetics approach here and go through the entire genome, literally one gene at a time, and determine what happens when each gene is inhibited. And so then you can see which ones are required for the process that you're interested in. So how do you do that? There are two important reverse genetics techniques that we'll look at in upcoming lectures. Gene knockouts, where you're physically deleting a specific gene from the genome, and then RNA interference, or RNAi, where you use double-stranded RNA to basically trick cells into shutting off the expression of the gene that you want to characterize. So with RNAi, the gene is still there, but its expression is reduced. Now, as I've mentioned, we'll go into more detail on all the techniques that I talked about in this video in the next few lectures.
But to sum up, uh, whether you're talking about forward genetics or reverse genetics, the basic concept is the same. And that is that if you can identify genes that are required for a particular developmental process that you want to study, then you're off to a really great start in terms of trying to understand uh, the mechanisms that drive that process. Plus, you'll get to have a lot of fun trying to uh, come up with really clever gene names for the genes that you've identified.